So now we start uh, the afternoon session with uh, the talk by Herbert Koch from Bonn, who is going to talk on the thin obstacle problem and Kalman inequalities and regularity, no, higher regularity of the regular set, right? Yeah. Okay, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation and the facility. Uh, I'm from Bonn, but it's still nice to come here to the Hausdorff Institute. <laughs> Um, I want to, um, there's a lot of um, research going on on um, thin obstacles, obstacle problem. And what I want to do is I want to explain two or three ideas which um, we used, used in a collaboration with those with um, Petrosian and um, Ben Mushi, who is here. And then there's an Kanaruland and Kanuji on the um, thin obstacle problem. Now let me start with the obstacle problem. So what we do is we look at, at the problem locally and um, we look at the function, also we look at functions which are non-negative and we look at the, the function of in the curve of the ball of beta swan um, that u squared plus um, u x, so the whole thing should be local, um, assume that we have boundary data given, anyhow we look at variations inside the ball, um, and then this leads to the obstacle problem. I mean, we either have, uh, so we can get minus that plus u is equal to 1 in the set where u is positive. Okay, this is, an, is a problem which has been studied since a long time. I want to make local statements and they don't want to express the locality uh, in the formulation, then the first question which occurs here is the question about regularity. And the regularity one can prove here, and that's, I guess, uh, that's C11. Um, and this has been 30 years, 30 years old. And I guess I should mention names, but I don't think so. Sketch here at this point. So derivatives are um, Lipschitz continu continuous and obviously in the set where u is positive, this u is smooth, uh, the set where u is identically equal to zero, um, all derivatives vanish, and, and so what we get is a picture where we have uh, some sort of uh, let me see this side. This is this type, where u is equal to zero, u is equal to zero, this is the contact set which I denote by k. Uh, then here we have u is positive, that's the positivity set p, and in between we have the free boundary d k. So uh, next, this is a sort of favorable free boundary problem. Uh, in the sense that there is some non-degeneracy. One gets quadratic growth away from the contact set. So there is some non-degeneracy. There is quadratic growth. So by this I mean when it's C11, so that it's relatively <coughs> vanishes, it grows, the, the, the growth is at, mo at most quadratic. But actually, it is quadratic. So if you look at a point here, then and if you look at a line here, then uh, u calls uh, quadratically. Now, so the next step is maybe to look at look at blow ups. So we blow this up, we scale, so that we get something non-trivial. And the possible blow ups one gets at the free boundary. Let's say look at a point. We look at the point. So this is normalized. There are two possibilities. Either um, we get some harmonic polynomial, um, 
of this Lehmann negative, or, and this is the more interesting case, where uh, in suitable coordinates we get, um, I guess I didn't pay attention to constants, um, one half x n plus the positive part of that squared. So, <coughs> we put zero here and look at rotate things so that we get this plot. Now, both things can obviously occur because these uh, harmonic polynomials, let's say um, xn one half xn squared, is definitely a solution to this problem, which would have which would occur here. Um, but if the situation, if we are the, um, at a point like this, then we get this blow up. Well, the next step down is we should look at the regularity of the free boundary. <coughs> of the free boundary. On, uh, at a point where we have this xn plus squared one half blow up. And then there are Hanak uh, inequality arguments which give C1 alpha for some positive alpha for the free boundary here. Um, so this is sort of the um, starting point for higher regularity. Look at, if one wants to look at higher regularity, and there's a, an approach by Kinderlehrer. Nierenberg, um, who did the following. So we look at this part of the picture. And we want to choose better coordinates, coordinates which fix the boundary and transform the problem to an elliptic problem. So somehow we change dependent and independent coordinates. Um, Ellipticity should not depend on coordinates or on changes of coordinates of dependent and independent coordinates. So we variables. So then we should get something which remains elliptic. And this is the Motocraft transform, partial Motocraft transform. So what do we do here? Now we suppose we are on this point so that the second vertical derivative doesn't vanish. And then we map the x prime xn. I want to distinguish the variables. And we map this to um, y. Oh, we map this to x prime. And here we take the vertical derivative of u of x. Um, and we call this variable y. If we have the C2 function here on the upper half plane, then this map, map is a C1 diffeomorphism because the second derivative here is non-zero, so this gives a um, second vertical derivative is non-zero, so this gives them a diffeomorphism, and we get a map from x to y. So the y is going to be the new independent variable. And then we write, we define a new function, mu of y is equal to mu of x minus y n x n. Of course, we have then two positive morphism, so we can express these things in terms of one, one of another. The vertical derivative is positive, so we make this object into a ball, the other half of a ball. So I call this ball, let's say, the other half b plus. And then we get, we have to do some nasty calculation. And then uh, out of that comes an equation f d to y b is equal to zero. Let's say in all this is local in b plus. And d y and b is equal to zero. Um, in D, B, um, so this comes.
comes out of this transform, this is a Hodokaf transform, so the inverse have the same uh, the same shape, and they get xn is equal to dyn v. So this goes the other way around, this leads to this boundary condition. Now, um, this is, I mean, ellipticity should not change under changing coordinates, so this thing is elliptic. This problem is elliptic. And now the end of the story is there are results by Moray in the earlier 60s, which says that in this setting we have a solution to this problem. So if we know that V is of, C, of class V2, implies that it's analytic. So once we know that this is analytic, we can go back. And um, I mean, what do we look uh, look for? We want to look at the set where d and u is equal to zero. Um, and so there's d and u is equal to zero, and then we can express the free boundary um, as a graph in terms of the function v. And I think I somehow got confused with the formula, so at least we get, anyhow, we get, we can express the free boundary as a graph um, of derivatives of V evaluated at, at the boundary, the vertical derivative of V. So, um, this is a proof to um, that regularity, higher regularity of the free boundary, and since I want to use that in the context, let me give a brief outline of the proof, of a proof of that, which is not the proof of Mori. So, we want to prove analyticity. How can we do that? Well, we can try to remember that analyticity means that there's a bound, there's a bound on the cause of derivatives. If we take higher derivatives, this is painful. So we don't want to do that. Um, that's, that's combinatorical. We could... I mean, we could try to remember other things. We could try to extend this elliptic PDE into the complex plane. We get a family of elliptic PDEs, and I think that, I mean, that that would work. That's more geometric. It's less painful. And this, this could be done here. Um, and we could try to remember theorems which give us analyticity in a more, I mean, in a simpler context. So if you have the, an implicit function theorem with this analytic objects, then we get an analytic dependence. So what we want to get, what we, we are done if we can, if we're able to, a problem like that, and we would like to think of the y coordinates as being variables, as, as being parameters which they obviously not are, but we want to think of them as being parameters. But the way to put them into parameters is, well, let's take some vector A in Rn, and then assume that everything is smooth up to the size of the boundary of the unit ball, um, and then we look out the ODE y dot is equal to A times 1 minus y squared, um, in the unit ball. So this is, a, is an analytic vector field. There's an analytic solution to that. It depends analytically on A. And to look at the map from Y to YA, which is the flow of this thing, A, to be evaluated at time 1 of the initial position Y. So this is an analytic dysmorphism inside the unit ball. It leaves the boundary fixed because the vector field vanishes here. Um, and now we can pull the equation back. We can pull the, the problem back. We can pull this back. Um, and then we get an equation f a of d to well, the pairs of first order derivatives. Um, so by this I note the, the, the express things in terms of these variables. And then we get an equation like that equal to zero. I suppress, suppress fourth order variables and so on. And now the dependence on A is analytic. We have the boundary data is fixed. 
If you can apply it in a set function theorem, which we count by checking the assumption of the set function theorem, we get anoticity with respect to A. Then we can pull that back to the variables, and we get anoticity with respect to the Ys. So this is sort of, I think, not so painful sketch of a proof for getting higher regularity. Okay, um, now this is one, one technique, and I want to explain a second technique. Um, so, in this context, and this is the, the Elm thing monotonicity. And um, Karlmann inequality. So I expect that you're probably much better, much more familiar with the arm from monotonicity, and less with the uh, with the Kahneman inequality. Uh, and I want to explain a little bit about the relation between the two, uh, and learn why we why we try to use the Kahneman inequalities and what they give. Well, the algorithm with the um, uh, frequency, which is R times the integral BR, it's here, no, it's normalized at zero, um, that u squared dx. divided by the integral d p r um, of zero um, integral u squared p sigma and the map uh, to this um, is monotonically increasing. So which somehow says that well, there's another thing we want to look at, and this is the, um, the map from t to the integral um, d d e to the t. So I forgot to say that you with one. So that this map to this u squared d sigma, the logarithm of that, uh, that this thing, this thing is convex. And this has a lot of nice consequences. It has its consequences doubling. It has its consequences that blow-ups, if you rescale things and normalize the L2 norm, that blow-ups are compact, so we get subsequences. It has the consequence that the leading part of an harmonic function is an harmonic polynomial, and so on. And it can also be perturbed for variable coefficients, but then the calculation is more involved. For the proof, is a calculation. Now, what are Kalman inequalities? inequalities have been used for uniqueness questions. So there's a differential, linear differential operator L, and the Kahneman inequality, and it has a function of the living on some domain omega, which I don't specify, um, and then there is a function u in, let's say, C2 zero, C infinity zero, that it doesn't matter so much. Uh, the problem is that we have complex support. Um, and the Kalman inequality is a family of inequalities of the type that we estimate e to the power b 
So q is a function which has to be chosen times u in some norm. And then allow me to be a bit sketchy. I don't want to specify the norms here. Uh, this is less or equal. Typically, one gets something like c divided by tau. Could be something different. That's not the, not the important part here. Um, e to the tau p um, l u. And this holds then for all tall mark jump and toss here. And of, of course, there have to be conditions on the linear operator, on the this phi and so on. Think of the L as the Laplace operator. I don't want to be specific about the operator. And if it's a Laplace operator, then you may take any, um, well, not any function, but you can choose functions with any level sets and so on. There's a large class of functions, so that this works. I'll say, I'll say a little bit more about that. Now, the idea to use that for uniqueness is simply the following. So we think of, we suppose we have a function, the solution LV is equal to V times V, this potential. And suppose, now I draw a picture and I want to simplify things a bit. Suppose that V is equal to zero here. And we want to conclude, so this is the set that we work at, we want to conclude that V vanishes here. So what we do is we take a cutoff function so that it's identically one here and decays here. We set u is equal to eta times v. If this is the x1 coordinate. We said we hope that we are able to choose v equal to x1 or maybe x1 plus x1 squared. If we put zero here or something like that. But let's think of x1 uh, to simplify this. And suppose we get an estimate like, we are able to prove an estimate like that, then we apply this inequality. So we get this weighted family of these estimates. We get some e to the tau phi v in some norm. We estimate it by a constant divided by tau e to the tau phi l v. So we found this by c divided by tau e to the tau phi l v. We plug in what we uh, L, L, U. L U. We express this in terms of V. There are two terms. When the operator L falls, falls on V, then we get this thing. Um, so this is then less or equal to C divided by tau. And let's suppose we, we can, there's also some E term, so um, some. Suppose we have some product estimate, um, u plus sorry, e to the tau t, e to the tau t u. And then we get something else, um, which is, well, um, I think I have drawn the picture in the wrong direction. So let me change that. We take minus xn here. Um, so we get something which is, since derivatives fall on eta, which is supported here. So in this set, we have e to the minus tau xn. If tau is very big, then things are very small here, and they are much larger here. Um, this term, so this, is, so this term is something small. This thing has the same sort as the same type of this. So if this is small, we can make this small, which we usually can. Then we can absorb this on the left-hand side. And we get a family of inequalities with one parameter, where we can choose tall large, which has the effect that we get a, put a high weight on this part and a small weight here in order to get uniqueness. So this is the argument that the, the Kalemann inequalities away from Kalemann inequalities to uniqueness. Um, what is the what do you want to do here for, for the obstacle problem? Now first let me come back to the Kahneman inequality. 
how does one prove the Kalman inequalities? And then I have to pay attention to time. So the proof of Kalman inequalities um, Proof of Kahneman inequalities. Well, the way it proceeds is we look at, we want to have this weight e to the power of p. And then we have the operator, and let's conjugate it. And let's call this operator L tau p. So this estimate here is an estimate for this L tau p, for this conjugate operator. So this is now a differential operator, which doesn't say that the proofs are necessarily simple, but it says that the proof is in the area of PDEs and not so much of special calculations. So this gives some advantages because then PDE techniques can be used, um, localization can be used, there is some sort of space-time view. There is the um, monotonicity formula relies on a calculation for every R. There is some sort of PDE uh, point of view to that, which gives a little bit more flexibility. Okay, so these are the tools. I hope that I could modify them a bit and explain them a bit. And now we want to apply them to thin obstacles, to the obstacle, or to the thin obstacles. Uh, Now, look at thin obstacles. And I want to be not too complicated. Um, you're looking at the, the simplicity, I want to look at the Signorini problem. So, what we do is we have again, again the situation. We have the other half ball. We want to look at local things, B plus. Here the ball is B prime. We are looking at a differential equation. This is equal to, and I want to keep things simple, so I don't want to have too many uh, inhomogeneities. Let's, let's say zero, but there could be something else. Uh, in B plus, in the upper half. And um, then we want this to be elliptic. The coefficients are elliptic. <laughs> and they're always continuous. Always continuous. Um, then at the boundary, we want to think of having a thin obstacle. So either we sit on the obstacle. And then the obstacle is going to be zero for simplicity, it could be something else. So what we want is at the boundary, the upper half u is larger or equal to zero. It's a thin obstacle. So what we want is that the A and J, G, J, U, the vertical derivative, and it's an obstacle, so this should go down. This should be lesser or equal to zero. And then we want that. A and K is on the formal level, dJ u is equal to zero if u is larger than zero on uh, B prime. Now there's a lot of lot of theory for this problem, and I guess I should mention much more than I um, that I'm going to do here. There's work by Caparelli and Co-workers, by Ralziba, and, and many things. But let's look first, let's do something simple here. Let's look first at the case when the A i j is down i j. And let's look at homogeneous solutions. Which are typical solutions we have to look at? Well, the first solution obviously means there's a solution, then a positive multiple is, is one of this problem. 
So u equal to 1 is the solution. It doesn't hit the boundary. It's um, harmonic. So there's no uh, the normal derivative vanishes. Then we could have the opposite extreme. We would have, could have u is equal to xn. Um, so in that case, u is identically zero. There's no other condition. We are harmonic, and this is trivial. So these are the following solutions. And this corresponds to the positivity set P. Here we have the contact set, which I, uh, the contact set, where uh, is equal to zero at the boundary. And now comes the next interesting solution, which is um, xn plus i xn, xn, xn minus 1, i xn to the power 3 over 2, and we take the real part of it. So, well, let's check that this is okay. This is, it only depends on two variables. This is a holomorphic function of these two things, so the real part is harmonic. So we get something which is harmonic in the interior. Um, at the boundary, if xn minus, minus 1 is positive, then um, we take the square root of that, we take the real part, then the vertical derivative vanishes at this point, these points. If xn minus 1 is negative, then um, if, if this is negative, we take the real part, then we get 0, and then we have the other condition. Um, and then there are, of course, other solutions uh, to this problem, like one half x n squared minus, uh, sorry, minus x n minus one x n squared. So this is a harmonic function, which is non-negative at the boundary. And of course, there are many others. The important thing is there is no classification. Only for n equal to 3, there's no classification of those solutions. And then um, there is a gap. What is known as there is a gap between the homogeneities 3 over 2 and 2 between the two. There's nothing connected with this gap which allows us to look at the highest order part. So let me denote by So either, either um, so we take as some x, let's say zero, let's say some zero is in the free boundary. Um, either u vanishes of infinite order. homogeneity is constant. So the homogeneity is independent of the sequence. So 
This allows us to define the set that we have. Here. Now that f three over two will uh, be the part with the blow up. Let's see the diagonal of the three over two blow up. So when we have that, we have this, this regular blow up. Then uh, this set is open. It's open in F. It's open in F. Um, So, um, well, I mean, this has been a topic with a lot of activities, and there have been a lot of previous results. The optimal regularity in a more regular setting is due to, uh, to Caffarelli and co workers. Uh, there is previous work by Oralceva and all these things. There is a book by uh, Petrosian, Chagolian, and Oralceva where all these things are very well uh, described. Now, um, well, I don't want to say much about the proof here. And I think there's more references which I, uh, which I should have mentioned, but I'll come back to some of them later. So, um, now how does the proof work? Well, the Kahneman inequality, we conjugate with a weight to energy type arguments and symbols in integration by parts, as usually with the Kalman inequalities. Kalman inequalities have only been used for linear equations up to now. So I think that's the first application, one of the first applications, and the only one to nonlinear problems. But the reason why this works is that the nonlinearity, the nonlinear behavior, occurs only at the boundary. And at the boundary, this is fairly mild. So I didn't explain to you the proof of the Kalman inequality, but the, uh, here for the thin obstacle, there's not a big difference. Um, okay. Um, so then we get this blow up. The Kahneman inequality has some robustness, which leads to the, to the openness of this regular part of the free boundary. And then one has to look at the neighborhood of different points to get the optimal regularity here. And again, I mean, all this was known under more, uh, under stronger assumptions on the, on the coefficients. Um, now, I want to come to the free boundary, to the regularity, which I'm going to close. That's three over two. Um, of this, this regular part of the free boundary. So what we look here, so the basic thing is that f 
3 over 2 is as calculable as the data from it. and then I say something about alternatives. Um, for the proof, I want to present the case when the coefficients are uh, that I chase and we have the, the Laplacian. And this has been worked with the Dwozian and when we she. So what do we do there? So we assume that we have a point where we have the flow up, uh, so we have this model flow up, um, the flow up xn minus 1 plus i xn to the power 3 over 2, um, and we look at the real part of that. Well, then we want to um, do a partial model graph transform. The photograph transform maps x to, well, this we write as x double prime, xn minus 1, xn, and we map it to um, the first components, and then we take the n minus 1 u, dn u, and denote this, these variables by y. Um, and then we define v of y as u of x minus xn minus 1, yn minus 1, minus xn yn. And then, same recipe, we get a very complicated differential equation. And this I want to write it down. <laughs> so the differential equation we get is that zero is equal to, um, and then we have the second vertical derivative. Now with respect to y, these are y derivatives by n minus 1, n minus 1, minus the sum from j equal to 1 to n minus 2, dj, where dj is the determinant of, and here we get the second derivative in the j's direction, we get dj n minus 1, v j n, v n minus 1 j, v n j, v n minus 1, n minus 1, v n minus 1 n, v n n minus 1, v n n. So this is an equation, let's say, of motion pair type pretty complicated and uh, maybe not, not so obvious what to do with that. So if you don't know what to do with a differential equation, we expect it to be elliptic because the Laplacian is elliptic, so ellipticity should survive. Um, I don't talk about the boundary data. Basically, that refuses to an equation on Rn because by symmetry, by the reflections, one can put it on Rn. So if you don't have any idea what to do with the link with the differential equation, we might want to look at a special solution. So this model solution here is a solution to this to this complicated nonlinear differential equation. So we might want to linearize it there. So we linearize of this this equation. If we linearize it at this object here, if we linearize it here. Uh, at this function here, then what do we get? 
how do we get a very nice differential equation? What we get is the sum, 0 is equal to the sum from j equal to 1 to n minus 2. We get here y n minus 1 squared plus y n squared. D, okay, plus um, d n minus 1 second derivative plus d n. So we get this differential operated uh, linearization. Of course, it is not elliptic. I mean, this comes if you trace what, what happens here. We have this, uh, this map here. Um, this, this behaves like uh, U behaves like the distance to the free boundary, like x to the 3 over 2. So this behaves like x to the 1 over 2. This is basically the square root mapping here. The square root mapping is harmonic. So we see the harmonicity there. But then we get the uh, conformal factor, which we have to divide through it. This is a multiplication and that gives this, this factor here. But this is a very, I mean, this is a well studied type of differential. Equations, that's it, the only pushing operator. Uh, it is so called sub elliptic. Um, and well, it's connected to Carnot groups, which we have this morning. But the basic upshot is that if you neglect some fine points, this is as good as a fully elliptic problem, and we get all the regularity we need. From this. I mean, it's not as simple as I say it here, but this is basically the same. So, for. Now, what are other proofs? Other proofs for that. So this I should say the same proof works, works for variable coefficients. So yeah, I don't have to do anything there, anything else there. Um, there are other approaches to this. So the regularity of the boundary. The boundary. There is a very influential paper by uh, De Silva and Sabin, which uses boundary HANA. They use boundary HANA inequalities, and that's a beautiful idea, uh, and they get they have the paper on the archive for months after hours, they get C infinity. Not good electricity, but because it's a discursive argument, um, we got an electricity here if the data is um, So this has been used also for a lot of other things, and there are a lot of names I should mention that we say this works. And try to not going to be complete. Um, I have to mention and want to mention there's a lot of work by several papers by uh, Capofalo, uh, Smith Vega Garcia, who is here in the, in the audience, uh, also with these ideas. Uh, then Banerjee, Zeller. Um, so there is uh, yeah, also other approaches to that which have been basically at the same time. What I presented here also works for the obstacle problem for the fraction of Laplacian. So the Signorini problem is basically the obstacle problem for the half Laplacian, but it also works for the, for the fraction of Laplacian. Um, and there <coughs> has been, again, simultaneous work by Cadieri and Neumeyer with the boundary Carnot argument. Um, there are, and this argument has also been used for parabolic problems. So when we sheet it somewhere in that direction, when I guess 
or he's going to present something in that direction. Um, okay, so what I want to do is I want to present basically two ideas, the Kahneman inequalities and this uh, the effect of the holograph transform of this being offset or problem. And I want to thank you for the attention. for the difference? Sure. I mean, uh, but there here you, you, you didn't have the coefficients, right? So, uh, well, I mean, there could be, you could be at the model solution. Then we have infinite order of vanishing for the difference. <laughs> then, then you have the zero for the difference of the zero. Mm -hmm. But I guess your question Yes, but, uh, but non-trivial non infinite order vanishing. Well, why, why shouldn't that be? Let me ask you the other way around. What, what, what's well, the intuition? Well, you are close to this. Well, on the other hand, you have those Kahneman inequalities, yeah. and mm, in some cases, the frequency formula, so it's not so clear. So you have a flow up to a solution, to an analytic solution of an analytic setting. But there cannot be infinite, I mean, to stay analytic. If the, if the problem is analytic. I mean, of, you, of course, for the original problem, you could have infinite order of vanishing. I mean, you, yes. Yeah. But, but not if you're close to, the, to, to this model solution. There's a, I mean, the, this, the homogeneity three half is pretty robust. Okay, other questions? Comments? If not, let's thank the speaker again.